Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. My name is Diana Chong from Brunei CSPS. Um, session two will allow a panel of ASEAN ROK think tanks and experts to share their key thoughts upon the two pillars, prosperity and peace. Specifically, we are talking about economic growth and um, political development. How, how can we enhance ASEAN ROK relations towards prosperity and peace? And in what ways can the new Southern policy support these objectives? So this is what we hope to get um, the thoughts of our experts. Let me quickly introduce to you the panel of our sev the seven experts. We have um, from the very right, um, Mr. Daljit Singh. He is the, from IC Singapore. Um, then next we have Nguyen Vutong. President, Diplomatic Academic of Vietnam. We also have Choi Yong Jong, Professor, School of International Relations, Catholic University of Korea. Sorry, yeah. you're not in order. Okay, <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, they all have to follow my rules. Okay, <laughs> Phillips. Philips Vermont, Executive Director, Center for Strategic and um, International Studies, Indonesia. Perhaps you could put your hand up. <laughs> Renato Cruz de Castro, Member Board of Trustee from um, Institute of Strategic and International Studies, Philippines. Pong Fi Sut, I'm sorry if I don't <laughs> pronounce it very well. How, do, how would you say it? Hong Bus Barat from Institute of Security and International Studies, Thailand. And we have Cho Wong Yi, Head Center for ASEAN Indian Studies, KNDA, Korea. So these are our seven panelists. Before I get them to share their views one by one, some house rules because we have very tight timing. <laughs> I can see that we only have one hour, 20 minutes for seven presentations, plus allowing some Q&A from the floor. So I have already strictly told my boys that they can only, they only have five minutes max, <laughs> half time. At four minutes, I'm gonna tap my pen and you got one minute left very, very strictly so everyone gets a chance. And then hopefully we can allow some Q&A from the floor. Thank you very much. Um, we will start with Mr. Daljit. Thank you. OK, good afternoon. Now it's difficult <clears throat> to say anything very new because a lot of things were covered in the last session. But I will begin by mentioning, I think I don't have to elaborate because of time limits, three big uncertainties and one certainty before I, I go on to make some suggestions. Now, three uncertainties, huh? the deterioration of US-China relations. Actually, many people may not realize how significant this is because it's a huge change in direction after 50 years of engagement, and uh, is bound to have a lot of implications and consequences. By all accounts, the change, uh, the US-China intensification of rivalry uh, and this new phase, by all accounts, it will be very long-term thing. It's not something that will end soon. That's one. Second uncertainty, is partly arises from US-China relations deterioration. And that is uh, the threats to the global trading system, the global trading regime by rising protectionism, the threats to the rule-based international order by actions by certain countries and uh, lack of proper response to deal with these actions. 
um, and also the threats to multilateralism. Um, for example, the World Trade Organization, which is so important to small and medium countries. Um, now, the third, uh, or third uncertainty is about U.S. policies in the future. The U.S. is in the process of reordering its strategic priorities and direction. It realizes that it cannot be the sort of global hegemon that it was, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago because its margin of preponderance over the others now is much declined. So he ha it has to reorder, retrench somewhere, get others to do more, I suspect so that it can focus more on the Indo-Pacific. But how this is going to be done, how the focus in the Indo-Pacific is done, what will be the priorities, all this is still being uh, talked about or discussed and the administration has, uh, doesn't have a clear cut, cut a policy, especially to Southeast Asia, because it has been focused so much on the Northeast Asian problem and the Middle East that uh, uh, one think tank scholar I talked to in uh, Washington, he said policy at the moment to Southeast Asia is just muddling through. They haven't th thought it through, you see. Um, so this being the certainty, of course, is China. China will always be with us because it is a neighboring country and it is an expansionist country. By expansionist, I don't mean territorial expansion necessarily, but because it's a rising power, so its interests and influence are expanding and it will have a huge impact on Southeast Asia. And, and, uh, and the broader region. Now, in order to deal with this situation, the ROK and the states of Southeast Asia therefore have to make themselves more resilient to pressures and shocks coming from outside powers by cooperating more closely and diversifying their economic relations as it is already happening. Interestingly, the uncertainties may help ROK and ASEAN states to be more strategically aligned now than before because both worry about a more aggressive China, a more unpredictable US, and getting caught up in the more intense US-China rivalry. Now, ASEAN and uh, uh, ROK economies are complementary. They are not uh, competitive, basically. Southeast Asia is open to ROK investments and there's a huge potential in Southeast Asia for ROK to diversify uh, op opportunities for economic growth. You know, Southeast Asian countries are growing at about 5% per year. There's a huge middle class, which I'm told by the early 2030s will be about 300 million people. So huge market. So there's, uh, there's a huge potential. The demographics are right. But of course, the Southeast Asians on their own part have to make their countries more attractive to investments. Some of Southeast Asian countries have been rather laggards in this. You know, um, they have to carry out quite a lot of reforms, some of them. Huh? Um, of course, and we have, uh, I have a list of recommendations which uh, were included in what was submitted by ISIS. Uh, I think some of the others have repeated it. I don't, don't have to go through them in detail, but basically that uh, ROK must join, you know, join ASEAN in vigorously supporting uh, free trade, the multilateral uh, uh, vehicles, uh, and uh, the, the global rules-based order. These are very, very important for us. 
and for specific things that you can do in relation to this is um, things like expedite negotiations to establish the RCEP, upgrade the quality of ASEAN ROK free trade area, you know, things like that, help in the economic development of Southeast Asia. Because um, if Southeast Asian countries, some of them remain poor and weak, they will become vulnerable to all kinds of security threats. They will become unstable. So it's in South Korea's ROK's enlightened long-term self-interest uh, to help in the economic development of Southeast Asia. The way that Japan helped the earlier six ASEAN countries, uh, economic development and won a lot of goodwill. Because eventually, when Southeast Asia is more developed, uh, you can profit more from trade and investments with it. And of course, I strongly support the people-to-people um, -people exchanges. Thank you. I think I'm over on my time, have I? Oh, oh, okay. Thank you very much, Daljit, from Singapore. Thank you very much, Daljit. Um, so, Daljit is one of our very senior um, experts here, so he was allowed two more extra minutes. <laughs> but he has succinctly described the certainty, more so uncertainties that have emerged, particularly with regards to um, emerging power of China and existing US as a superpower upon ASEAN ROK, and he has made some very concrete recommendations as to how ASEAN ROK, because they are mutually, they are more mutually benefiting than competitive ent entities, how they can benefit more and increase their resilience and capacity by en um, enhancing their cooperation. So thank you. Next we have, um, is you first? Okay, Vu Tung from Vietnam, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Diana. Um, I think that uh, I can uh, share many points have, that have been raised uh, uh, by Danjit and uh, the people uh, uh, in the uh, first panel as well as the discussion we had yesterday. I just raised some really uh, um, short points here. Um, we are uh, trying to achieve the goal of uh, pr prosperity and peace in the relations between uh, are okay and ASEAN. So I think that that, that is really a, a big uh, goal for us to follow. But uh, we have to remember that peace and prosperity uh, between ROK and ASEAN cannot uh, be separated from a bigger picture, broader context of peace and prosperity in, in the, in the uh, region now, Indo-Pacific. Uh, so, so I think that um, uh, we would need a better understanding of the North, uh, sorry, uh, South, um, a new Southern policy of the ROK in the bigger picture of uh, ROK's foreign policy. That we, uh, so uh, the new Southern policy of the ROK should be placed in the broader context of the policy of uh, ROK with regard to China, uh, U.S. as an ally, and then um, the northern, a new northern policy of ROK to with regard to North Korea and Russia, and then uh, the uh, new southern policy itself. So, so I think that uh, if we have a better understanding of all these uh, aspects of the South Korean foreign policy, we have a better context to see how the new southern policy uh, with ASEAN would involve. Uh, secondly, uh, we would also need to place the new Southern policy in the uh, more detailed context to see the relations between South Korea and uh, ASEAN as well as with India. Yesterday we talked a little bit about, about that. So we would see how uh, relations between the ROK and ASEAN on the one hand and on India on the other hand would be, uh, would be developing. 
So, so, so that is the, 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 the first point I'd like to, to make. The second point is about um, the uh, Mekong uh, aspect of the New Southern policy. We talk about uh, a rule-based order, we talk about the role of the media, uh, small and medium countries, and we talk about the areas that can be developed, including economic uh, trade and investment and uh, human resource development, capacity building, so on and, and so forth. But I would like to highlight another aspect of, of that. The, the type of cooperation between uh, uh, media, uh, medium and small countries are of special uh, uh, significance because it, it is based on uh, greater trust, greater confidence uh, between the two sides and with the uh, and similarity in the conditions as well as complementarity between the two sides. Uh, but we also need to uh, to highlight that this type of cooperation between, uh, say, uh, ASEAN countries and the AOK uh, is even more important in terms of introduce in terms of producing what uh, Ambassador Gail Dalabo said in the morning, that the best practices, best practices, because it can be used as the uh, point of preference for other type of, um, uh, of a cooperation between the ASEAN countries and other uh, actors of uh, stakeholders, including the United States, China, and um, Japan EU. So, so the Mekong sub-regional uh, region is the, I think, the good case in point here for ROK and ASEM, uh, and the Mekong uh, countries to produce the type of uh, uh, best practices in, uh, in checking with other type of uh, projects that uh, the uh, lower Mekong countries are having with, uh, say, China. So we have complaints about uh, the BRI-related rela projects in the Mekong area. So the cooperation between the ROK and ASEAN, uh, and ASEAN countries in general and uh, ROK with uh, lower Mekong countries in specific can be, uh, can be uh, seen through that best practices perspective to see it, uh, for the party concerns to see that this is really something mutually uh, beneficial something really reinforcing the trust between the party concerns and really uh, bringing uh, peace and prosperity uh, for, uh, for, the, for the region. Point number three is about the rule-based. This has been repeated many times, but I would like to uh, uh, reiterate that uh, the best place for uh, rule-based order, uh, the construction of the rule-based order in the Indo-Pacific region is the ASEAN-led institutions. And in this context, ASEAN countries and the ROK can have so many uh, opportunities to work on that uh, based on the existing ASEAN-led uh, institutions that include the AIF, the EAS, the ADMM Plus, so on, and uh, the uh, YES, so on, and so forth. So, so, so the cooperation between ASEAN and the uh, uh, are okay would be really making the uh, uh, two sides comfortable in uh, uh, in building this the kind of uh, room based order based on the ASEAN led institutions and that leads to the final point I'm making here is the question of choosing sides or choosing the principles and the uh, the the uh, the, the, the uh, cooperation between um, ASEAN and the ROK, I think, is the very good example of the two sides taking both sides and principles at the same time. Why in the other set of uh, relationship, people can take in side rather than taking position, or taking position rather than taking side, or taking no position or no side. But in the case of ASEAN and ROK, we can have the best uh, uh, of the two words, we both taking side at the same time. We're taking positions. So I would end my presentation here and uh, uh, open for the Q and A sessions that comes later. Thank you, um, Butong. So um, he's given another very interesting presentation, sharing the same similar anxiety with our 
first speaker with regards to U.S.-China relationships as superpowers upon ASEAN ROK, but he also highlights the need to look at broader geopolitical context, um, referring to India, and he's also mentioned the need to look at small, medium countries, the Mekong region, and to focus on best practices. Thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker is Choi Yong Jong. Thank you. Okay. I do agree that uh, ASEAN and South Korea face uh, uh, common challenges in the uh, upcoming Indo-Pacific era, uh, particularly, you know, the, the rivalry between U.S. and China is kind of posing serious uh, dangers to uh, both parties, you know, ASEAN and uh, South Korea. And I do agree that you know, many uh, presenters said that uh, we need, uh, now we need a rule-based order in a broad Indo-Pacific region. And my approach to uh, have that kind of rule-based order is to revitalize, uh, resuscitate, uh, you know, now kind of dormant East Asian uh, regionalism. So uh, my suggestion is that uh, the upcoming South Korea ASEAN summit meeting to be held in Busan should aim at uh, revitalizing East Asian regionalism and also laying the uh, foundation for a rule-based order in the, uh, in the Pacific region. And so f as of now, the prospect of revitalizing East Asian regionalism uh, appears not so uh, hopeful, but I, uh, we cannot no longer uh, avoid that kind of you know, creating rule-based order. In the past, East Asia uh, tried to delink economics from uh, politics, and East Asian cooperation remained largely at the uh, functional level. But now, East Asia can no longer separate economics from politics. That is because, you know, with the return of geopolitics and geoeconomics, the region must tackle the issue of uh, building a lasting uh, peace and stability. You know? So otherwise, I think we have to choose, the region have to choose between U.S. imposed regional order or the hard reality of uh, great power politics. So the close cooperation between South Korea and ASEAN will significantly improve the chance of successful regional cooperation in East Asia and beyond. And the solution is that there are already institutions and we also know that ASEAN has uh, played the prime mover, a uh, role of a prime mover of East Asian regionalism, and also ASEAN uh, leaders are stressing the importance of rule-based order, and also ASEAN has suggested, already suggested, ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific uh, region, you know. So we should recognize, South Korea also should recognize the centrality of ASEAN and also the importance of AOIP. Uh, so far, the South Korean government has pursued its regionalist policy as a means of promoting peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula rather than as a goal in itself. So South Korea needs a change of perspective, you know, instead of uh, uh, trying to focus on Korean Peninsula only South Korea should uh, restart from creating rule-based order in cooperation with ASEAN uh, parties, uh, partners. And I think you know, peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula may follow as a natural outcome of successful East Asian cooperation. You know, so you know, South Korea would first render support for ASEAN's effort to resuscitate uh, uh, East Asian regionalism before asking 
ASEAN partners, you know, support for its uh, ambitious peace initiative toward North Korea, which is now in stalemate. So if South Korea recognize and support ASEAN initiative, then I think, you know, ASEAN side would reciprocate this uh, South Korea's thoughtful consideration with deep understanding and support for South Korea's uh, diplomatic initiatives. So South Korea and ASEAN side should continue uh, functional cooperations at various levels. And in addition, South Korea and ASEAN may initiate, initiate uh, kind of you know, more broader cooperation uh, project, like you know, the, the ASEAN is uh, pursuing mass, having a, a master plan on ASEAN connectivity, you know, 2025, and it's kind of uh, trying to attract many uh, investment from various sources, and it involves, you know, inefficiency and also duplication. So we can come up with, you know, some kind of, you know, coherent uh, connectivity enhancement program at the ASEAN Plus Three level, you know, for that. Uh, South Korea and Japan and China may seriously consider kind of, you know, at first revitalizing APT, and if not, uh, if it is not possible, we may consider joining, you know, ASEAN, you know, kind of, so three countries, northern three countries may join, you know, ASEAN to promote, you know, regional order. I mean, maybe this may be a kind of provocative idea, but I think, you know, it, it, sometime in the future, we may think of, that kind of edit, you know, alternative. So I think, you know, the upcoming South uh, Summit meeting between South Korea and ASEAN should provide, you know, this kind of, you know, vision for the next 30 years. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Byung Jong, Professor. Um, so he similarly calls for increased um, cooperation from Korea to ASEAN. Um, and he emphasizes that the next summit meeting similarly should aim to revitalize East Asian regionalism and laying the foundation for a rule-based regional order in the Indo-Pacific region with many recommendations. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, Mr. Vermon. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Diana, and thanks for the Korean diplomatic <coughs> Korean National Diplomatic Academy for inviting me. I would uh, structure my presentation into three parts. <clears throat> Number one is, uh, like many other speakers before me, uh, highlighting the at least two a major strategic issue uh, confronting us, uh, ASEAN and, and uh, of course, uh, the Republic of Korea. And uh, a second part will be on the uh, modalities <clears throat> and the context and uh, direction of ASEAN ROK uh, cooperation uh, in the near future. And lastly, some uh, you know, short uh, policy recommendation. Now, on the first part, on the ma major strategic issue, of course, <clears throat> uh, we've been talking about the US-China uh, strategic rivalry. But what is concerning the most is that it tests our own regional organization and regional mechanism. And that, I think, is, uh, is a really serious issue for ASEAN. Because I think in the past 50 years, 52 years, ASEAN has been uh, uh, you know, in the, in the mode of uh, trying to avert a major conflict spilling over into the region. That's a major interest of, of ASEAN in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the past 52 years. Now, <clears throat> secondly, uh, because of this strategic rivalry, we see a continued skepticism about multilateralism, and it's been uh, talking about as well by the uh, previous speaker. In addition to that, we see some blurred division between security and economic affairs of uh, uh, countries in Southeast Asia, and uh, for sure also in the Northeast Asia. And uh, the U.S., as we know, has become more and more less interested in uh, multilateral diplomacy, and so does China. Uh, well, uh, I can give you one example that relates to this uh, issue of uh, China-US rivalry uh, with regard to the uh, multilateralism and probably international law. Uh, the PCA ruling uh, in 2015 
uh, on the South China Sea clearly uh, tells us one thing, that you know, China, of course, rejected the, the ruling over South China Sea. Uh, uh, but then you see the U.S. is kind of uh, trying to urge all countries to respect uh, UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. So you see this very uh, unique situation where China is actually part of the UNCLOS, and they are not respecting the UNCLOS. The U.S. is not part of the UNCLOS. They are urging other countries to follow the UNCLOS. So you see, actually, this is a kind of a major power grade politics. And then the, uh, it brings us to this, to CDD's, uh, you know, kind of a, a notion of a, uh, the strong do what they want, the weak suffer what they must. And ASEAN, for that matter, I think in the past uh, 52 years, once again, uh, never want to be in that position uh, as a, uh, the weak suffer what we must. But actually, uh, we rely on multilateral diplomacy. Now, the second strategic issue is, of course, on the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific question. Uh, ASEAN already offers an outlook, uh, and then actually uh, what it entails is that uh, ASEAN telling the other countries, <coughs> dialogue partners and countries beyond ASEAN, that <coughs> uh, ASEAN would want to see uh, a vision of Indo-Pacific that is not dominated by those of security concern. And that, I think, uh, the highlighted message of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, by doing so, uh, ASEAN would like to emphasize that the more actually the merrier in our part of the world, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think ASEAN welcome various great power initiatives, including Belt and Road Initiative. I think we should uh, also uh, be frank about this. And then the uh, quality infrastructure development uh, promoted by the other side of the equation, uh, or what we call the Quad, for example, uh, that uh, I think ASEAN intends to have a, not a zero-sum situation uh, where gain of one project are lost for the other. So for ASEAN, I think this uh, needs to be uh, understood as well. And uh, it seems to me that ROK uh, seems to agree with this uh, because uh, I think the new Southern policy is testament to that. The language that uh, the Southern, new Southern policy is using, uh, people to people, you know, peace and prosperity, uh, you, is, uh, are very similar to the lexicon of, of ASEAN countries in various documents and various initiatives. Now, uh, what are the the consequences of that? The the the, the third uh, strategic. I think that can be a strategic one is domestic context of uh, ASEAN countries when it comes uh, to the question of China and the U.S. You know, voters in various countries in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and you know, Malaysia as well, and the Philippines. I think we've seen some switch. You know, that affect the the policy of the government towards uh, towards the, uh, the U.S. and towards China. And uh, we don't know for sure what is going to happen uh, uh, among these voters. But uh, then it, it relies on the, the ability of the government in the end to deliver uh, you know, economic prosperity. And then the, you know, the, the role of the US and China then uh, I think will be equally important to convince uh, voters and uh, citizens across Southeast Asia that uh, they are uh, wanting to see a prosperous Southeast uh, Asia. Now, <clears throat> second part, the modalities, context, and direction. I think what is important as well to be noted is that ROK and some ASEAN countries are middle powers. Uh, we are not big powers. And middle powers has, have constraint, but also have many opportunities. Because uh, the example of Australia and Canada back in the 80s, you know, they, they define themselves as middle powers, and they come up with creative idea of security that is non-security approach. So they know because they are middle power, they are, and will not be able to, uh, to influence hard core, you know, strategic issues, military issues. So they come up with something, you know, that is more manageable for middle powers. And I think then ROK and ASEAN needs to come up with this notion as well that we are middle power. We, we are not, and we don't have the capacity to influence the outcome of the strategic competition between the US and China but we should come up with some creative breakthrough between uh, ASEAN and uh, ROK, for that matter. Uh, second modalities, 
is that uh, we've seen the more nexus between security and development in Southeast Asia and are okay. In the end, ASEAN countries are developing countries. So, you know, development interest uh, might dictate the policies of government in Southeast Asia. So then they can be uh, very blind when it comes to ideology, you know, uh, for some countries. They, they, try to, they might try to oscillate between the two countries and get the best of the both worlds. And, and uh, that should be, <clears throat> I think, uh, need to be understood as well. Over time, countries in Southeast Asia uh, engage with the US power to indirectly balance the, uh, China. Uh, but a different path of development, once again, will uh, influence how consistent they are and uh, how far they can be uh, pursuing their objective either to China or through, uh, uh, through the US, right? Now, <clears throat> uh, with that kind of a regional context, I think uh, then we can uh, try to understand the nature of relationship between uh, South Korea and ASEAN. When President Moon Jae-in <clears throat> uh, unveiled the new Southern policy, uh, at least there are two questions uh, that, can be, uh, that can arise. Number one, could Korea in terms of peace and security, shift its attention from its traditional regional stakeholders. You know, uh, probably for uh, ROK in the past, US, China, Japan, Russia, and DPRK are more important compared to Southeast Asian countries in terms of uh, strategic questions. And second question, uh, maybe, could Korea see ASEAN member states beyond regional construction at the first place between North and Southeast Asia region, connected only as a base of production provider and raw material provider. And I think in the past at least two days, uh, the answers to these questions are, to me, is very clear that uh, yes, uh, Korea has shifted their attention really into Southeast Asia and their strategic interests also and economic interests shift uh, to Southeast Asia. But then what can be done? Uh, from the ASEAN perspective, there are several things that uh, needs to be taken into account uh, with regards to the question of what can be done. Number one, uh, we understand that the peace in the Korean Peninsula will certainly remain the top priority of uh, uh, ROK. But the question then for Southeast Asian countries, uh, are we actually the stakeholders of this peace in the Korean Peninsula? Or are we just the, are we just the watcher of this uh, issue in this uh, Korean Peninsula? Uh, as far as ASEAN is concerned, I think uh, we should be uh, the stakeholders of the question of the peace in South Korean Peninsula. Because <clears throat> uh, ASEAN might have interest to ensure whatever deal uh, in the future between President Trump and Chairman <coughs> Kim Jong-un uh, do not provide new pretext for conflict in the region. Uh, because if the US or the world acknowledge the possession of nuclear weapons of uh, North Korea, the DPRK, that certainly against the principle of a uh, non-nuclear zone for Southeast Asia. And that uh, for sure will affect <coughs> the dynamics within Southeast Asia when it comes to uh, the issue of nuclear weapons of the DPRK. Now, in this slide, I think ASEAN, uh, together with ROK, can actually socialize uh, uh, North Korea through uh, the existing multilateral uh, organization that we already have, that is ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, in the IRF, everyone, everybody is there, including North Korea. So <clears throat> I think ASEAN, ROK, and other countries needs to socialize North Korea more into this <clears throat> diplomatic platform, uh, aside from the issue just for the nuclear weapon. The more we socialize North Korea, then I think the more they are willing, hopefully, <laughs> to, to, to adjust themselves into international norms <clears throat> and order. So uh, with the socialization, I think we can provide the DPRK to find another incentive to give up or at least moderate its hold on the, its nuclear uh, possession. Uh, once again, then it depends on ASEAN whether we can utilize uh, the IRF uh, to socialize uh, DPRK. 
uh, on the question of uh, if we want to be the stakeholders of the peace in the Korean Peninsula. Now, second thing that uh, uh, should be done is that uh, ASEAN and ROK needs to, uh, to have a more coherent outlook on how to engage each other. Uh, looking from the new Southern policy, it seems to me that ROK is more than ready and more than willing to engage Southeast Asia. The question is always be whether the ASEAN countries are ready. You know, this is, I think, the weaknesses on our side, the ASEAN side, to be frank. You know, our, all dialogue partners have a great initiative, so many initiatives, but ASEAN seems always to be very slow in responding. So this is, I think, the homework for ASEAN countries uh, to work on. <coughs> now, uh, on the some uh, policy options, uh, with all uh, that have been said uh, earlier, uh, number one, the policy option should be then we need to convince uh, when it comes to the question of the uh, Korean Peninsula, which is the interest of uh, ROK and uh, ASEAN, uh, for the reason that we need to be the stakeholders, is that uh, we convinced DPRK to utilize multilateral platform, uh, that is the ASEAN Regional Forum, to discuss their future uh, of peace and uh, economic openness for themselves. Number two, I think uh, when it comes to ASEAN and ROK, <coughs> functional, I agree with Professor Choi's uh, uh, statement earlier, that we need to work on more on the functional cooperation. Uh, then we need to identify areas where rules and norms are needed to facilitate interaction between the uh, states and promote cooperation. You know, some areas have been mentioned earlier, Tan Sri Rastam in his uh, remarks uh, mentioned about a digital economy. <clears throat> I think this is uh, something that we can work on. Cyber security. Uh, also, I think uh, we have a mutual interest, maritime safety and uh, other maritime related uh, matters because uh, in the, uh, if we come back to the Indo-Pacific outlook, ASEAN Indo-Pacific outlook, maritime cooperation seems to be the core of the views of ASEAN on the Indo-Pacific cooperation. So there are so many areas of cooperation in this maritime related area that uh, ROK is uh, very ready <coughs> to cooperate uh, with ASEAN countries. Thirdly, I think the future of openness we rely on whether uh, either ROK and ASEAN could work more to reconcile differences among regional constituency. Can be the voters, domestic uh, uh, policy makers, and so on. Now, lastly, to reiterate the point about being middle power, uh, ROK, I think, has the unique position uh, as the provider of regional uh, public goods uh, in terms of economy, technology, and, and others. Uh, yesterday, we had a closed door uh, session and then the, I was raising this uh, observation that, you know, compared to Japan in the 70s, and, uh, uh, you know, where Japan expanded very, very quickly economically, in, uh, Japanese, uh, J Japanese investment, you know, spread over Southeast Asia, uh, there was certain level of anti-Japanese investment sentiment across Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. Uh, we suffer from uh, at least one riot in Jakarta in 1974. Same thing in Malaysia and same thing in Thailand in early 70s. And now China, I think, suffered the same thing. You know, there is a certain degree of anti-Chinese uh, uh, growing in economic influence across Southeast Asia. Can be cultural, uh, can be uh, other things. But so far, we have yet to see anti-Korean sentiment uh, across Southeast Asia. While, uh, as we know, uh, ROK is one of the uh, investors, big investors in many ASEAN countries, uh, largest trading partners for some ASEAN countries, but you have not met with certain level of resistance. So I think this is the modality that ROK can work on, and uh, ASEAN, I think, can also uh, realize this as a modality, that there is certain level of cultural affinity. Uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, K-pop maybe, but K-pop came very much later. <laughs> Uh, but other things, uh, a cultural modality that Professor Kim Young Jun, uh, as an anthropologist, earlier mentioned that uh, there's a certain degree of understanding between uh, people of ASEAN and uh, uh, South Korea. I think I should stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Philips. Um, very, very extensive um, and in deep insights. Um, he's clearly an expert here. He has made a number of very extensive, very quite frank um, 
observations, which is in the paper. I can't do justice by summarizing, which I will not try to. Basically, from my understanding, he is saying that the US-China uh, rivalry is inevitable, but the crucial issue here is the fact that it's testing the efficacy of um, the multilateral diplomatic approach that ASEAN is always relying, historically relying upon. So this is important. Uh, another important thing I take from you is that you're saying that how we progress between ASEAN and ROK, which you are supportive of, at the end of the day, we really need to look at the types of power distribution across the region between countries. There are big powers, medium powers, small powers. And not only that, um, sometimes political direction may change um, in view of the realities of ASEAN, whereby there are countries that are very need developing and that may take priority in terms of their political strategy, you know, immediate priorities of um, growth and so forth. And um, Philips has given us, I mean, the question is, is ASEAN ready? I think that's what you mean, right? Because the countries have different political priorities because we need to develop. He's given four big policy options of which our other panelists have also um, outlined in quite detail in their papers. So I hope everyone has a chance to read it, to do, do it justice. So thank you very much, Philips. Our next speaker is Renato Castro from Philippines. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start my presentation, let me first express my utmost appreciation to the Korean National Diplomatic Academy and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for giving me and, of course, the think tank Albert, uh, Albert Del Rosario Institute for International and Strategic Studies an opportunity to be part of this network and also expressing my appreciation to the members of the ASEAN ISIS network for considering us as one of them, although this is our first foray into this ASEAN network. I don't know if I'll be presenting something new, but what I would basically do is uh, provide it in broad, stro uh, broad, broad strokes looking in terms of diplomatic strategy. Uh, three weeks ago, I attended a conference in Bonn University in Australia, and it's about, of course, countries in the region that are caught in this great power rivalry the title of the conference, and which is, of course, I would apply, is Skila versus Charides. From, from Odyssey, Odysseus, you know, he was worn by Circe after the Trojan War. Ulysses, that you have to go through the strait where you have two monsters. One is a land-based monster, Skila, and the other one is a sea-based monster, monster, Charides, or that's why you have the term in English or idiomatic expression between the rock and the hard place, between the devil and the deep blue sea. It applies in our region right now. We basically have this strategic competition presenting us to basically great powers in a competition. You know, looking at, of course, what's the root of this competition, it has something to do with the unique nature of our security system here. Uh, in uh, the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific region, we have an external power that is basically providing security guarantee in the region in terms of its forward deployed forces and, of course, its alliance guarantee. This is based, of course, on this power's interests way back in the 20th, uh, early 20th century to maintain a balance of power and after, of course, uh, 1945, providing what you call offshore strategic balancing. And now, of course, you have China emerging, basically aim first in driving the United States 7th Fleet from the first island chain and hopefully pushing the American 7th Fleet and rendering 7th uh, Fleet into the second island chain and rendering, of course, United States strategic offshore balancing uh, useless in a way that, as mentioned by President Xi Jinping in 2015, that, uh, you know, in the Chinese dream, Asian problems would have to be solved by Asian alone. So this basically put us in the middle, ASEAN countries, which is, of course, association of small and middle powers. But my approach here is, we have to look at ASEAN history. We don't have to look at ourselves as victims. Remember, ASEAN thrived in a situation of adversary. ASEAN was created in the 1960s, at the time that you have a war, Vietnam War. ASEAN became, uh, strength, uh, be, uh, became stronger. We established the Secretariat. We have the first summit meeting after, of course, the unification of Vietnam. Then ASEAN played a very important diplomatic role during the Cold War. 
of course, when you have Vietnam taking invading Cambodia. So that's basically the nature of uh, ASEAN. We, uh, we thrive amidst adversary. So we have to look at it as a game. We have to look at it as a game that we would have to play with the great powers. And ASEAN is basically survived by playing what I call the equibalancing game. We pit one great power against the other with a hope of balancing air. But of course, the situation has changed right now. Uh, it's dangerous to pit two great powers who are bent on basically pushing each other out of the region. So we have to basically qualify this game, modify this game. Uh, equibalancing, of course, looking in terms of support from other powers in the region, specifically as what Philip called middle powers. And so what, you know, we have to look at the context of uh, ROK offer of strategic relation with ASEAN in terms of middle power politics. So what are basically the middle power politics? Well, who are the middle powers? Number one, of course, they have bundles of powers, but they don't have comprehensive capability. No nuclear power, but uh, viable conventional military capability. And of course, they have no intention of being great powers. Uh, they are also rely primarily on soft power, K-pop, Korean telenovela, Taekwondo, uh, like just in a way, certainly with Japan. And of course, great powers are committed to a rules-based international system. So as mentioned by Philip, of course, a number of great uh, middle powers basically expressed their support when the Philippines won the case against China in the permanent court of arbitration. Australia, uh, Japan, but not so much with ROK, with our, when uh, ROK came out with the support. That's basically you know, a mark of a middle power that you adhere to a rules-based international system. Now, what would basically happen if you have this dynamic coalition between ASEAN and, of course, a middle power just like uh, ROK? Number one, of course, we provide a strategic buffer between these two colliding great powers. Uh, diplomatic buffer in a way that we won't allow them to basically dictate the face of regional dynamics. We prevent them from clashing uh, against each other, and we basically uh, prevent polarization of the region. Number two, of course, establishing and support of institutions, regional institutions, multilateral institutions, where, and of course, hopefully by maintaining this regional institutions, great powers would try to resolve their competition in terms of uh, multi, you know, uh, talks, diplomatic maneuvers rather than, of course, diplomat, uh, naval maneuvers or conflict in the open seas, in the first island chain. Also, because, you know, the two, uh, two blocks, South Korea and, of course, ASEAN, could strengthen their comprehensive capabilities. ASEAN could be, needs uh, investment, technology, uh, of course, uh, in the case of the Philippines, I focus on this, South Korea has provided my country weapons. You know, we bought, of course, uh, the first uh, time that we bought fighter planes, because we used to receive from the United States, came from South Korea, and the Filipinos appreciate this very much. We acquired two frigates, we got one free. Ooh, you know, that's the best deal we ever got. Uh, so, uh, of course, also in terms of markets, we provide markets over there. So, the important point there, of course, is comp developing each other's comprehensive capabilities. And the other important role of middle powers is, of course, what you call uh, bridging links. That as a middle power, uh, South Korea, ROK, could also link with other middle powers. And this is not a new idea. This was raised by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in 2009 when he talks about the Kia, middle powers that would play a very important role. Korea, Indonesia was mentioned, and of course, Australia. So it's really uh, would be very important for ROK to bridge with other middle powers, to prevent competition with other middle powers. Because we need this, you know, this, uh, this mass of ASEAN and other middle powers to basically prevent these two great monsters from colliding with each other. So uh, I think it's the best that South Korea also mend its relationship with other, uh, some, another middle power in the region because I think this will be the best for the region if we have provide that very important diplomatic bulwark buffer between these colliding monsters. Of course, this is easier said than done. Uh, ROK would always be focused on the Korean Peninsula because of your problem in the North. ASEAN would always be faced with the problem, number one, to a certain degree, the South China Sea, and of course, the fact that China is becoming an, you know, uh, uh, economically dominant in the region. ASEAN, in playing this, uh, you know, this game of equibalancing, 
doesn't want a single power dominating Southeast Asia. We don't want to be a backyard of China. So the best is, of course, we have to have this, all these powers uh, you know, present in the region. Hopefully, if we have this partnership, this strategic partnership, we will be able to find this, you know, the safe water between Skila and Chalibis, between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. I end my presentation there. Thank you, Renato. Very interesting, very literary. <laughs> okay, so um, it's in this paper, very interesting. I, I didn't have time to read, but it's good to hear from it. So he's talking about how ASEAN as the diplomatic buffer can form strategic alliances with mid powers such as Korea in the face of superpowers such as US and China. Um, we work for each other's mutual benefit, we can develop each other's niche and capabilities. Thank you. And our next speaker is Pon. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you block your name. You can, you can call me Paul. <laughs> That's e much easier. So uh, being, put, yeah, being put in almost the last person, there's a, you know, some disadvantages, you know, like everybody's already covered <laughs> all the points that you want to <laughs> mention. Yeah, so um, I, I just want to elaborate I mean, on uh, two points that you know, my colleagues already touched upon earlier and just right before me. Uh, that is middle power diplomacy. Uh, that's important. That's the, the niche that Korea uh, would want to consolidate and strengthen it, its, uh, its presence in, in Southeast Asia. And where's, where is the niche you know, uh, that the South Korea can, 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 can Consolidate can can strengthen, which is like in the Mekong subregion, right? Uh, the Mekong subregion should be uh, a cornerstone uh, of the uh, Korea's active role in in the regions. So the focus will f further narrow developmental gap between uh, ASEAN members, especially the new and and the old member member countries, and also enhance mutual economic uh, benefit between ASEAN member and ROC and other regional stakeholders. So um, Korea can prioritize you know, areas where it has knowledge and advantages such as capacity building, uh, human resource development, economic regulation, rule-based uh, you know, regulations and management, uh, infrastructure development, of course, and information technology. So certainly uh, Korea has various uh, developmental projects you know, or programs in this sub-region, but what I want to suggest is that uh, Korea can improve uh, the effectiveness of its activities, you know, through coordinating within ASEAN and other regional stakeholder, uh, you know, deeper. In this regard, uh, Korea should sort of streamline developmental projects through existing platform, all right, especially through close uh, collaboration between uh, its own Mekong, AOK cooperations and uh, Iravadi Jalpaya Mekong Economic Cooperation Strategy, which is AC ACMIC, uh, which is like existing in, 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 in sub-region now. So as an important development partner to ACMIC, uh, Korea can reprioritize uh, Mekong AOK cooperation's objective to be in line with ACMIC uh, priorities. So after all, supporting the development in the Mekong sub-region through the work of ACMIC and, and strengthen the work of ACMIC will improve rule-based sub-regional mechanism. Uh, this will benefit not only uh, Mekong countries, right? Uh, as more attention and resources will be channeled to this sub-region, uh, but it also helps streamline uh, uh, Korea's developmental project with other developmental partners you know, to Mekong sub-regions, including India, uh, Japan, USA, uh, Australia, uh, European Union, as well as China. Right. These will ultimately uh, strengthen ASEAN communities and its centrality in the context of changing uh, regional and global environment. So uh, this is like you know the the the, the, the narrowest idea that uh, South Korea can can focus on on you know because you know uh, there are a lot of conflicts in in or tension in Southeast Asia and this probably the best uh, South Korea can 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 assert its role 
right? In, in mainland Southeast Asia, uh, in maritime Southeast Asia, perhaps you've seen like my colleagues talk about tension in South China Sea and perhaps Korea, you know, uh, deep down inside uh, doesn't want to involve, you know, <laughs> in this kind of tension. So uh, your alternative way is, you know, like involve more in mainland Southeast Asia and eventually, you know, would strengthen the unity uh, of ASEAN uh, indirectly, and through that means, uh, I think, uh, you know, the ASEAN centralities and uh, rule-based order could be uh, exercised in a more effective way. Uh, I'll, I'll, my presentation is very short because everybody has talked about, you know, all the points, so I'll pass uh, the, uh, my mic to... Uh, Thank you. All his points are in the paper, um, so he's very good supporting it and how Korea can coordinate its projects, especially with existing projects, paying special attention to the Mekong sub-region development and so forth. So thank you very much. Next we have um, Cho. Who thank you. Uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, so my name is uh, Wong Gi Cho. Uh, I'm professor and head of center for uh, ASEAN India studies here at KNDA. Uh, first of all, uh, as a host of this event, I'd like to uh, express uh, my gratitude and appreciation for all the uh, ASEAN colleagues. Uh, from the morning session to this session, I think um, the discussion and presentation is really uh, productive very constructive suggestions, so uh, I really thank you. And also, uh, in, in Korea, I mean, because you are all the guests, so the host speaks last time, <laughs> the last. So, uh, right, so um, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, three things. Uh, the first one is um, uh, New Southern Policy. Well, uh, I, I think even among uh, our ASEAN experts, there are some, some element of misunderstanding about what New Southern, uh, New Southern Policy is. So I'd like to, uh, to my knowledge, clarify uh, what this uh, new Korean government's uh, initiative is. Uh, the second one is about uh, Indo-Pacific, Korean stance on Indo-Pacific. Also, there are lots of uh, misunderstanding about uh, Korea's uh, stance and position uh, regarding uh, the Indo-Pacific question. Lots of media uh, describe that Korea is kind of at loss, try to avoid making choice, taking side between U.S. and China. Of course, there are certain truth, but I think uh, there's, there's not a best way of describing how we have been uh, responding to the U.S.-China rivalry and the emerging uh, regional uh, architecture. The third one is uh, uh, the, about the Korea-ASEAN cooperation. Well, uh, first, uh, the certain policy. Well, uh, I mean, uh, in, in popular media outlet, people all, always talk about the three P's, uh, people, prosperity, and vision. So these three uh, elements. These are just visions. So, uh, and also, the certain policy is not a uh, already kind of uh, set. I mean, it is evolving uh, kind of broad uh, framework, and the uh, concrete policy elements and policy packages are still being being uh, made. Right. So, if you uh, look at the website both in Korean and English website of the Presidential Committee on New Southern Policy, there are some list of uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, we uh, have been uh, kind of, uh, implementing. Um, I, I think uh, New Southern Policy has three uh, core policy elements. The first one is economic. The second one is uh, diplomatic and political. The third one is uh, strategy. Uh, in terms of policy content, I think, uh, first of all, New Southern Policy is Korea's external economic policy. We try to diversify our external economic portfolio 
from just a few countries that we have been concentrating on. For example, if you look at Korea's uh, trade profile, more than 25% of, of our overall trade is with China, like everybody else in the region, right? Uh, so this sort of uh, uh, asymmetrical interdependence with a particular country proved not so helpful. So uh, the new government, the Moon Jae-in government, tried to diversify, tried to put some of the eggs we have been put in China basket out of it and try to kind of uh, diversify our uh, relationship to the, one of the most dynamically growing regions in the world, which is ASEAN and India. So uh, in that sense, I think it is a soft, de uh, soft decoupling kind of uh, approach away from China toward ASEAN and other uh, countries in the southern region. Uh, second, I think New Southern policy, uh, this is, uh, I think, a diplomatic rebalancing policy. So if you look at the uh, conventional diplomatic orientation of Korea, I think uh, I would say more than 80% of diplomatic resources of ROK have been uh, used in maintaining relationship with four major powers because these four major powers, China, US China, Japan, and to a certain extent, Russia, these four major powers are most important stakeholders in deciding the future destiny of Korean Peninsula. But now, if you look at political economic profile of uh, ROK, I mean, our national interest goes way beyond the Korean Peninsula. Right? So now, ASEAN proved to be one of the most important partners in economic, political, in every dimension, right? So we try to uh, rectify this sort of bias embedded in Korean diplomatic uh, practices and orientations. So the rhetoric is to, to elevate our ties with ASEAN countries to the level of four major powers. So why we, we have that kind of rhetoric. So anyway, so, so this is a kind of diplomatically and a politically uh, kind of uh, strengthening relationship with, with ASEAN. Uh, I think in that regard, I think, uh, Phillips, you pointed out whether uh, you raised the question whether ASEAN is stakeholder or bystander on Korean Peninsula issue. I think definitely ASEAN is an important stakeholder. And in New Southern policy, um, Engaging and socializing DPRK, North Korea, is very important element of New Southern policy, actually. If you look at uh, President Moon's uh, speech in his uh, Singapore lecture last year, right, he mostly spent his, his, his uh, uh, speech remark about the potential benefit that would come out of, uh, of resolving the North Korean issue. So uh, in that regard, I think ASEAN's uh, uh, effort and intention to engage DPRK and try to socialize North Korea is very important. And this is an explicit uh, intentional purpose of the certain policy. Well, uh, the, third, uh, the third dimension of the certain policy, I think this is a, a uh, reinvigorated, uh, Korea's reinvigorated uh, regional cooperation strategy. If you look at the early days of uh, ASEAN Plus Three cooperation, uh, then President President DJ Daejun Kim Kim Daejun was really uh, instrumental in pushing forward the ASEAN Plus Three regional cooperation. But now, ASEAN centrality and unity and the, the central role of ASEAN in regional cooperation in this region is not like before, right? So. Uh, with this new uh, initiative, the certain policy, we try to reinvigorate Korea's uh, role and contribution uh, together with, with ASEAN. Uh, yeah, so I think that's um, the three aspects of the certain policy. The second uh, thing is uh, Korean uh, government's, Korea's stance on Indo-Pacific. Well, uh, yesterday uh, in the closed session, uh, my uh, MOFA uh, colleague, 
uh, briefly uh, talked about this. Well, uh, I think uh, under New Southern policy, we have four principles of regional cooperation. The first one is openness. Uh, we aim for open regionalism. We do not like closed regionalism. The second is transparency. The second principle is transparency. We, we want to promote transparent regional architecture. The third one is the principle of inclusiveness. So we support for inclusive regional cooperation and regional architecture. We don't want anybody else to be left out of this regional cooperation, Indo-Pacific cooperation. And the fourth one is ASEAN centrality. We think that it is our uh, national interest that the regional cooperation in Indo-Pacific should be based on ASEAN-led multilateral uh, mechanisms. So we strongly uh, endorse AOIP, and I think there are lots of commonalities between New Southern Policy and AOIP. Yeah, uh, so uh, our stance regarding the uh, Indo-Pacific cooperation and U.S.-China rivalry, I don't think it's a matter of, uh, of a choice. So we are open to and willing to cooperate with any regional initiative, whether it is a BRI or a U.S. Free and Open Indo-Pacific, whether it is a India's activist, as long as these uh, countries' regional initiative contribute to enhance the connectivity in the region, I think you are, we, are, we are willing to uh, cooperate. So I don't think it's appropriate to describe Korea is not making a strategic decision to participate in U.S. in the Pacific or take part in China's BRI. It's not a matter of participation or being part of. It's a matter of uh, cooperation, right? So, so I think in, in that regard, uh, this is my last point. There are uh, a strong, strong element of uh, convergence between uh, Korea's perception and approach and that of ASEAN. Um, so I think um, in this regard, I think uh, uh, if you look at the, the, the 30 years of uh, progress development, uh, between ROK and Korea since 1989 when uh, ROK joined uh, ASEAN as a sectoral dial partner, uh, there are lots of progress in economic, social, and political dimensions. But uh, in the increasing, uh, in, in the environment of increasing uh, US-China strategic uh, rivalry, I think uh, ROK and ASEAN should uh, make some sort of uh, effort to enhance our uh, uh, confidence in strategic cooperation. I think there is a, some, some uh, element of a deficit element in strategic uh, trust and cooperation. Uh, so I think it is important uh, to make a common, common position and voice together regarding important regional uh, strategic uh, issues. And also, I think there are a lot of rooms to, uh, uh, to work together. I mean, uh, as I pointed out before, uh, the economic uh, dimension of New Southern policy is getting too much attention. But as I pointed out before, there are other dimensions, political dimensions and strategic dimensions. So in that regard, I think, uh, for example, in maritime security, I think there are a lot of rooms to, to, for us to uh, work together, right? For example, for example the uh, MD, in MDA area, maritime domain awareness, and the, the uh, Coast Guard capacity uh, building, yeah, there are a lot of uh, kind of areas of uh, cooperation. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cho. Um, he did go over a lot over time, but I felt that he was giving a very good clarification, which will reduce some of the anxiety that may be felt by ASEAN participants, um, particularly the three main issues which are on our mind. Number one, more clarification on the New Southern Policy Initiatives, what are the intentions, Korea's stance on Indo-Pacific issues, and um, how do you really look at Korean-ASEAN cooperation? 
So I think that was more like a question answer to Professor Cho, which he has very well uh, explained to us from the, to, to the ASEAN side. Thank you very much. So I know that we, do I have five minutes? Yes. yes. So you have five minutes. The floor only has five minutes to, for Q and A. I will allow three show of hands for questions first, and if we have time, we'll continue. So three hands, hopefully from some of the open, some students probably, um, but four, okay, two from ASEAN and two from the wider audience. Can I have, um, I saw a show of hands, okay, the lady on the third row and Okay, two ladies, more to women. Okay, good, thank you. I'll let the young ladies ask questions first, to the, not to the old lady, but to the panel. So, um, the lady at the back, can you stand up and state very, in one sentence, two sentences, what is your question? Right. Hello, uh, my name is Cecilia Chung. I'm policy coordinator at the Presidential Committee on New Southern Policy. Um, thank you for your insightful presentations. It was very thought-provoking. Um, I just have a brief comment and a question to our ASEAN presenters. Um, first of all, I believe that uh, one of the objectives of the new, new Southern policy is to partner up with ASEAN uh, to really become co-producers of regional public goods. And we see ASEAN as a valuable partner that we can do this with. How can we better utilize ASEAN-led mechanisms to this end? Um, my comment is that um, our commemorative summit in Busan next month should really go beyond uh, cementing our already robust relationship. It should really signal and send a message that we are both jointly committed to becoming uh, uh, equal partners in providing these uh, very much needed regional public goods. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So that's one question, one question per person. Um, I'll, it could be to the panel, but I believe some of our ASEAN um, participants here can also answer it. I allow one, one or two persons to clarify for the lady who would like to answer this question. So Renato and then Philips can. Uh, specific public good, that's of course maritime security. That we have to ensure that the waters in both East and South China Sea remain public goods. That no single power should dominate those waters. Is South Korea willing to lay its stake over that public good? That means also diverting your focus away from the peninsula towards maritime Southeast Asia. So yeah, easier said that what can we contribute? But then they have to look at the implication and the costs because that will entail resources on the part of South Korea. That will also entail angering, you know, making, uh, angering a dragon up there. Okay, thank you, Philips. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll respond in a more, in a more technical way of uh, how to utilize the ASEAN-led mechanism. Uh, learning for, from other countries, other dialogue partners. I think they, they, they always coordinate their initiatives through their agencies and put it into the ASEAN mechanism. The U.S. uses uh, USAID and uh, Japan has similar thing. And uh, Korea, I understand uh, you have a Korea foundation and uh, I, I don't know how much it is integrated into the ASEAN Secretariat and uh, to fund all the initiative and coordinates, but I think that's one way to go, uh, you know, how to uh, best use the ASEAN mechanism in order to facilitate the initiatives coming from ROK to the ASEAN countries. Okay, thank you. Um, second lady in the middle row, if you can state your one question. Um, okay. Um, thank you for all panelists for uh, the insightful thoughts regarding the ROK and ASEAN relations. Um, I'm really intrigued with the uh, idea of utilizing ARF in, 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 in engaging uh, North Korea uh, more into the multilateral forums. But uh, the question is, we, 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 we know that um, how North Korea decision-making process is solely, we can say it's solely 
uh, based on the, their supreme leader um, decision making process. So, um, while the, R the ARF itself, it's um, an ASEAN mechanism that's the highest level of meeting, it's only in the ministerial level uh, meeting. So, how exactly um, ASEAN, in this case, um, ARF or other um, ASEAN mechanism, can play a role in supporting the uh, peace process in Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Okay, um, two panels to answer. Let me look this way first. Anybody from here? Yourself and one more. Okay, Philip, Philips and Wutong. Yeah, uh, I agree completely about engaging and socializing North Korea, but I would add one more point, which is uh, experience sharing. So I think uh, other uh, Viet uh, Vietnam and other ASEAN countries, I think especially Vietnam, can be a good position to share with North Korean colleagues about uh, develop development, um, economic development experience at the same time to uh, uh, boost the legitimacy of the ruling party. I think I think we can we can do that. So. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about how fast we can achieve that goal, but gradually, later, and step by step, we can we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Philips agree with Wutong. <laughs> <laughs> One more answer on this. Anybody? Okay. Thank you. Um, so Datu, you ask the question. Thank you very much. Uh, this is arising from the statement with uh, Professor Cho made, which is ASEAN is also a stakeholder on the North Korean issue, and also related to the last question, which is, what are the possibilities? Uh, without, without wanting ASEAN to crowd the field now, there are so many people uh, you know, involved in this process of engaging with North Korea. What are the possibilities of Chairman Kim being invited as a guest to meet with the ASEAN leaders in Busan. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, uh, I'm, I'm not working on that issue, uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, uh, it is reported that we do not exclude, exclude that possibility. So uh, I think uh, some things are being prepared under that kind of scenario. Last question from my ASEAN colleague. Tiong Sam. Last question. Thank you. I was complaining that you have to catch up by asking. Well, I just want to take the floor to thank the last speaker from Korea for clarifying many points that I had in mind that I misunderstood your new southern policy. But just to uh, clarify that if you are aiming at ASEAN Korea common voice strategic issue, global issue, I think you have to bear in mind that this is very difficult. Even within ASEAN, we set for ourselves 10 governments the year 2022 to create what is called the ASEAN Common Platform to coordinate our position on major global issue. So I just want to ask you specifically, for example, international terrorism, do you think ASEAN and Korea can share any common position? Migrant workers, can you share any common position with ASEAN country? But this is a very difficult issue because in ASEAN, we have sending country, receiving country, neutral country. Thailand is both sending and receiving. Just to give you some example that is very difficult. For the part of socializing DPRK, I had direct personal experience. I used to serve in the ASEAN Secretariat. I attend ASEAN Regional Forum. And could see the change in the DPRK participation 
in the early year, they came out our way attacking South Korea first, America next. Never say anything constructive. But later on, they become very diplomatic in their explanation. They seek support for their views. They even know how to lobby to tone down the chair statement about the Korean Peninsula. So I believe we are succeeding. And you know DPRK also acceded to the TSC. They also appoint their ambassador to Indonesia to be ambassador to ASEAN. So they are trying. And we are glad that we could win some of their trust that to show them that not everyone in the world are against them. In ASEAN, we are listening. We are fair, and we don't condemn. We just want to have dialogue and cooperation and understanding. No question, but just to thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Close.